Welcome everybody to another episode of SF Live. This is episode 16. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the CEO of the Sword Financial Group. Before we start talking with our guest today, Brett Cook, the CEO of Endeavor Silver, we're just going to remind you real quick that this is an interactive format and you can use hashtag AskEDR for your questions live during this stream. We're going to be live for about 15-20 minutes, so feel free to start posting your questions right now and we'll get to those towards the end of our conversation here with Brett. We have a list of property or uh, questions actually prepared for Brett to talk about. Uh, given the times we're in, uh, some of the questions are fairly obvious, ob obviously. Um, we're going to get to those in a second. Uh, but before that, please make sure that you're a follower here on Twitter, at Sora Financial. Make sure you turn on the alerts. That way you get notified when we go live again. Also, follow us on YouTube or Instagram to get uh, access to our videos directly. Thank you. So, let's switch over. Brad, welcome to the show. And uh, I'm going to switch over to this one. I keep still learning the, the software here for the scenes here. Switching scenes. Brett, uh, thanks for joining us today. And I hope you're doing well and everything's safe with you. Uh, good morning. All's good. Fantastic. Um, uh, we we got to talk about the obvious elephant in the room and Corona, COVID is, is the topic of the day. Um, right now, it's still taking all the headline news. So I'm really interested. How is Endeavor handling the current situation? How are things going? How has your day-to-day -day changed right now? Well, at the end of February, we had our uh, board meeting and uh, we were asked to put together a uh, coronavirus plan, both preventative and response plan. Uh, we spent the first two weeks of March uh, diligently uh, putting in place an executive team here in Vancouver, an executive group in Mexico, site-based uh, leaders for each. Uh, we have medical personnel at each site. So uh, I was a bit actually concerned at how slow things seem to be moving and we had a management call just before mid-March to to go live on the plan when we were informed by our VP Ops that we had uh, potentially our first case. And so our group swung into action uh, and fortunately within 24 hours all the symptoms were gone and it was a false alarm but uh, uh, we had two cases that weekend that both uh, uh, were not confirmed thankfully uh, but it really tested our plan and our ability to respond uh, we self-isolated uh, the individuals, we isolated their uh, compatriots, we sterilized their workplaces. Uh, it was basically a go-go weekend and we came out of it, I think, with flying colors. Very proud of our group. We, To this date, six weeks later, we've still not had a positive test of COVID-19 at any of our sites. So uh, from an Endeavor point of view, very good. Fantastic. So I think Mexico has less than 9,000 cases right now. And um, it hasn't been impacted as much, fortunately. I'm curious to see the like, analysis on it, whether that's a weather-related thing because it's just warmer there or something, and uh, only the Northern Hemisphere is sort of uh, impacted by that. But uh, quite curious to see how that's playing out because as, as of today, I think Mexico has entered phase three of the pandemic, um, from what I understand. And I'm just curious, like, so you, you also to learn more that about Endeavor's plans on restarting the mines or one thing is um, Mexico mentioned that mining might come back April 30th. I think the limitations might run out then officially. Um, what's the plan there and can you give us an update on the operation side now? So the Mexican response was uh, very slow and uh, our view on uh, the whole situation in Mexico is kind of good news, bad news. Uh, the Bad news is that Mexico uh, was not prepared, um, and AMLO was kissing babies up till two weeks ago, uh, well, three weeks ago, um, and then they went straight to stage two. So uh, non-essential industries shut down April first, including mining, uh, and we all suspended our mines at that time, except, interestingly enough, for the big Mexican companies who deem themselves essential and have stayed open. And so the good news, bad news aspect of that is that uh, even though Mexico is two weeks behind America and haven't even come to the steep part of their own curve yet, uh, there does appear to be on a, on a per capita basis quite a lower incident rate, less than 10,000 cases, less than 1,000 deaths. Of course, they don't have the testing that others do, but um, uh, the interior, especially the area of the mines, uh, you know, the central part of the country, um, there doesn't appear to be much spread of uh, the coronavirus in Durango, Zacatecas, Chihuahua, etc. Um, so I think we're lucky in that way. Uh, since the government declared the national emergency and went straight to stage two on March 31st, uh, most of the mines have shut down. Uh, you know, from our point of view, we're basically spending two and a half million dollars a month here to stand still. So what's new is that the president on Sunday came out and said that uh, he would open up 
uh, non-essential activities May 17th in the 900 municipalities with no known cases of COVID-19. And all of our mines are located in such municipalities. Okay. So we're now actually preparing uh, to go back to work mid-May. How, how long is that ramp up period? It's like, I'm really curious, like ramp ups, you can't shut down a mine overnight. You don't just flick a switch and leave and, you know, drop the keys in the mailbox and you're out of there, right? Um, how, how long does the ramp up take to get to baby, pretty much back to 100% because it's just not that simple? Yeah, well, ramp down was basically two days because you select the key people who need to stay for safety and security and whatnot. Uh, and then you just basically let everybody else go home and stay safe. Uh, ramp up is two weeks. Because okay. you've got to contact everybody and arrange their transportation. And uh, even though we don't have very many expats, we have to consider uh, two-week quarantine if we bring expats back. So it's it's actually quite complicated. And we're in the planning stage now, even though we're a month away from a possible restart. Interesting. And uh, But you haven't given out any guidance or like um, earnings warnings or something like that, like the big Dow companies all do, say Q2 is just going to be messed up, but don't even bother. Or um, Well, we and everybody else just withdrew our, our guidance. And uh, it's... Guidance is suspended until we know what the heck's happening. Exactly, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so, so you said cost, cost are actually, and I think that's quite interesting. It's two and a half million dollars a month for you just to do nothing, right? So, um, you got to keep people on payroll. I'm not sure you can furlough, or I'm not even sure if gov Mexican government has announced any programs, financial aid programs. I haven't seen anything going through the news here real quick this morning. But uh, is there any support from the government? Any tax breaks, or at least uh, tax uh, pauses, or something on pay? You know, we're getting uh, quite a, um, aggressive fiscal stimulation from Canada, U.S. Uh, I don't know if it's true in Germany. Uh, we're certainly seeing it in Asia. Uh, Mexico? Nothing. I mean, they beef, beefed up the health department resources, and that was about it. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so you're pretty and much left alone there for now. Yeah, interesting. Um, since, since, you know, how much cash are, do you have in the bank? Is, like, is that sustainable? Like. Let's say push comes well, to shove, because we're just at the year end cash was twenty three million. Year end working cap was just under forty. Uh, we've depleted obviously in the first quarter because our big capital spend is usually in Q one. So we're going to guess that uh, end of Q one cash is around sixteen working cap in the mid thirties. So uh, we don't have any long term debt. We're we got a healthy balance sheet, uh, but our cash is a bit lower than we'd like. And um, you know we the sooner we get started, the better obviously. No, that makes sense. Um, let's switch gears here a little bit. Let's talk about the gold price and silver price in general. Um, because of the recent gold price move, you, Endeavor has become a gold producer uh, on a percentage <laughs> basis, per re uh, revenue basis, right? So um, you, you said, uh, or you were usually a 55 to 60% silver producer. Now it's pretty much the other way around. Um, can you give us more detail on that? Let's talk about the silver price itself uh, too. So oh, that's we're very happy to have our... And we used to call gold our byproduct, and now actually it's the silver that's the byproduct. And at the current metal prices, we're very happy to be a gold producer. Uh, you know, it, it'll swing back and forth based on the gold-silver ratio, obviously. And I do think that the ratio is going to come down over the course of the year. Uh, people wonder what the heck is wrong with silver. It went basically from the 85 ratio all the way to 125. Uh, currently, what, 110, 115, something like that. So it's pulled off of the high. We're not out of the woods yet on the ratio uh, by any means, but the fact is gold has played its traditional role. Coming out of a period of market panic, uh, everything got sold down, including gold and silver, but immediately the first sector to respond is gold. Why? Because it's not only uh, a hard asset, it's the only hard asset that's portable. It's not real estate, it's not factories, it's portable. And that's why it's been used for, for millennia as money. Uh, silver, because it's emerged in recent decades as a strategic industrial uh, metal, uh, only responds to the monetary influence uh, after gold has already taken the lead. Wherever gold goes, silver follows, silver lags behind gold and then plays catch up. We're lagging gold, we haven't played catch up yet, it's coming. Okay. Here, here's the clickbait question for you. Has the, the, the drop in oil price, does that make any difference to your guys' operations and uh, what kind of cost savings can you expect from that? Uh, actually, very little, partly because we're an underground mine that doesn't use a lot of diesel and partly because Mexico sold forward or hedged their entire annual Pemex production in January at $49. So there's no there's no break at the pumps in Mexico because they're still getting world you know, $49 for their uh, for their oil. Um, so, yeah, we're not going to benefit from the oil. 
Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> so you're not actually getting money for burning it. Yeah? So. Well, we are we are benefiting from the peso. The peso is depreciated from 19 to 24 against the U.S. dollar. That's a 25 percent depreciation in three months. So uh, that that's a nice tailwind for us. Uh, you know, only about 30, 40 percent of our costs are peso costs, primarily labor. So that if you do the net net, it's about an eight percent benefit so far year to date. Uh, but we'll take that. We like that. Yeah, no. But I think the peso is getting weaker. Yeah. No, it's, especially since the you know the pandemic is just about to hit Mexico, really. And that's the thing, right? So, and the other thing to point out, we used our guidance uh, prices this year: seventeen dollars silver, and fourteen twenty-five gold. Obviously, at fifteen and a half silver and, and uh, high sixteen hundred gold, um, we're offside on our silver production in terms of revenues, but we're way onside in terms of our gold revenues. So it, it more than offsets the. Uh, shortfall in the sore price uh, and it is i believe temporary um you you mentioned temporary but i was still i was still going to ask like the gold and silver price right now does that make any difference to your production schedule or plans and reserve model as well not really we're not adjusting our plans because i think this is a month-to-month -month thing i don't think it's a year-to-year -year thing and um you know it's it's not easy to change plans uh we have our reserves and that's what we're going to mine for the year and they should do just fine at these prices Okay. Now, we don't often talk to producers. We're looking, usually chatting more with the exploration side of things. And for them, oh, $1,600 gold price, all of a sudden they have a 100% increase in reserves and um, they're happy to put that out every week, right? So um, producers are a little more conservative in that regard. Um, let's switch over to some questions we got. And we got some questions in from, a, from an analyst, actually, who wants to stay anonymous. But uh, I think they're really good questions. And I'd like to remind everybody to use hashtag AskEDR uh, for your questions here on Twitter. Uh, we'll get to those um, in, in a second as well. So um, we pretty much talked about restrictions on mining. That was one of his first questions. Any data points indicating that uh, the restrictions might be extended? You, you said May 17th. May 17th, if I'm not mistaken, is going to be pretty much the date when... Uh, the municipalities that haven't been affected can start non-essential businesses again or reopen non-essential businesses, just to confirm. Yes, that's what the president announced. Okay, cool. Um, EDR itself, like there's a question about mergers and acquisitions. Obviously, the market has seen a run to liquidity and a lot of silver projects or gold projects have been hit hard. They're slowly rebounding. But uh, how aggressively are you looking at mergers and acquisitions right now? We're always pretty aggressive. So last year we pulled the trigger on a small brownfields acquisition in Guanajuato, but it was a real uh, uh, game changer for the uh, asset because it extended the mine life by several years and gave us instant access to new high grade. The context of that acquisition was that we picked up some ground immediately adjacent to two high grade ore bodies that we mined up to property boundaries. And we worked on the, <laughs> on the acquisition for years and finally got it done last year. And we literally were able to go to the property boundary and start mining again. Uh, we have a similar opportunity at Bolanitos this year, uh, three ore bodies that stop at property boundaries. We've been in advanced discussions and we're obviously hopeful that we'll get something done. And what it does is two things. It gives you a significant extension to mine life, multi-year extension to mine life, and it gives you instant access to more high grade and allow you to fill the plants. Both of our plants right now at Guanajuato and Bolanitos are running uh, below their capacities and with more access to high grade ore, uh, you not only get more throughput, you get more metal because of the higher grades. Yeah, okay, that's fantastic. Um, obviously gold at 1680 or close to $1,700 again. And uh, do you see more generalists now coming back into the sector? And I've been saying for years now that we needed a bigger drop in the Dow Jones and S&P before generalist investors come back into our sector, which is a high risk sector, because it was too easy to make your 20, 25% in the main markets. Do you see more interest now coming back? Uh, well, absolutely. We've seen a rising tide of passive investing for several years now, and I think 40% of Endeavor is owned by passive investors. Um, a lot of them smallish, um, but they don't talk to us. I mean, it's not like they talk to management. They're, it's all algorithmic driven. No. And so uh, what we're seeing is that uh, in the bigger markets, just in recent weeks, as a result of the COVID-19 panic and then the the follow-on bounce back. We've seen a, a, a spike in volatility during the panic. Uh, volatility came down uh, during the bounce back of the broad equities and the strengthening of gold. Now, actually, we're starting to see the equities uh, soften again. We're seeing volatility tick up in the last few days. Um, so the generalists are very short-term, is basically my point, that they are coming to gold 
on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. They're not yet coming to gold to stick. Yeah. No, that's interesting because I've heard from various companies similar things. Like some companies receive inbound calls from pension funds trying to co-fund a project acquisition, while others just crickets. It's just really not. I wouldn't say it's a general, a general generalist comeback. <laughs> so, yeah. so there is there is sticky money out there, but for a company like Endeavor, it's of a market cap of uh, over two hundred million US. Um, what we're seeing is more of the family office wealth management. Um, small cap funds that are interested in, in uh, taking positions in a gold company or a silver company. And that's where we're seeing sticky money for us. Okay. Um, just coming back real quick to the project acquisitions, are you just focused on Latin America or I actually hear that a lot of Mexican companies, for instance, producers are going further north. They're looking in the US or even in Canada and start sniffing around data rooms. Uh, is there anything, you, are, you, are you focused on Latin America exclusively? Uh, not exclusively. We've been actively looking at assets in Canada and the States for several years. And, and um, you know, we have no problem buying uh, north of the Mexican border uh, or south, to be honest. And we have an office now for several years in Chile. It's an exploration office. But we've looked at some producing assets in Chile last year and we'll continue. Uh, so that's the other part of the M&A strategy. In addition to small brownfields acquisitions in Mexico, we would love to break the small underground mine mold and, and actually acquire something bigger in an open pit. We don't mine gold, we love silver. So that's basically our sweet spot. Okay, so that sounds good. Um, more uh, project specific or uh, operation specific question. You mentioned that you were going to switch workforce from contractors to employees at Guanava C. Um, has that is that plan still in place, or what's the pl- uh, what's the plan moving forward there, and the impact on operating costs? So we're always going to use some mining contractors for mine development at Guanacaste and Bolanitos. It's just that we felt we had too many last year, and we've been pairing back. So that's really the message on uh, contractors at Guanacaste and Bolanitos. There's still going to be some there, but fewer. Okay. Um, moving forward, in the next three to six months, obviously news flow is. More, more or less dictar- uh, dictated by COVID-19 and Corona. Is there anything else you have in the pipeline that you, that you plan to put out? Or is the you know, production results are going to be iffy and financial guidance and stuff, but um, anything in terms of exploration? Are you doing any greenfield exploration? Or what, what can investors make more, let's generalize it. What can express, uh, investors expect in the next three to six months from you? Uh, we had a very busy expiration quarter in Q1, and we only shut down the expiration at the end of March as well. So there is actually some pretty good uh, drill news uh, we expect it to flow here in the next few weeks, uh, both Guadalajara and Bolanitos. Uh, Terra Nera, which is our next core asset and potentially our largest and lowest cost mine, also is going to have some news. This quarter, we're expecting a presentation to the board on May 12th. And not long after that, we hope to say something publicly about the final optimization of our pre-feasibility study. Uh, we're all assuming that uh, the recommendation will be to go to full feasibility, which is less than $2 million in less than a year. So we're fully funded to take care of the next step at Terra Nera as well. And full fees would actually open up a number of uh, debt financing opportunities for us. Fantastic. Brett, thank you so much for coming on the show. We just hit our time limit. This is great. Um, really appreciate it. Thanks for asking or answering all the questions we had. Um, I think it was really insightful also for the investor joining just to talk about what's going on in, this, in, in the area in Mexico itself. Um, everybody, thanks for your questions. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube. Make sure to follow us here on Twitter and uh, stay tuned for the next one tomorrow.